Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's Brzezinski Current Issue Seminar within the Zbigniew of Brzezinski Initiative here at Johns Hopkins SAIS. I'm Carla Freeman, and I direct the Johns Hopkins SAIS Foreign Policy Institute, or FPI, a research institute within SAIS established to connect the school's intellectual firepower to the policy community with a mission of helping to address the international challenges facing the United States and the world. We were honored to have Dr. Brzezinski as a senior fellow at FPI for many years. Before I introduce our distinguished speakers today, and I have to say how thrilled we are to have Ariana Huffington join us for this series. Let me provide some background on the importance of the Brzezinski Initiative to SICE and take a moment to highlight the legacy of Zbigniew Brzezinski here at the school. Along with Dr. Brzezinski's distinguished roles contributing to U.S. strategy and, of course, his service to the country as U.S. National Security Advisor, Dr. Brzezinski was that rare combination of a statesman and scholar, a scholar who made significant achievements in his academic field. Part of Dr. Brzezinski's academic career was spent right here at SAIS, where he was a tremendously popular professor of American foreign policy. I actually audited one of his classes before he, count, he, he stopped letting auditors sneak in. As a professor and later while senior fellow at the SAIS Foreign Policy Institute, Dr. Brzezinski hosted a bi-weekly current issue seminar series. The seminars were a highly coveted invitation for a select group of scholars, policymakers, and journalists to gather at SAIS to discuss pressing issues of international concerns. Discussions that were so intense and intellectually challenging that they are still remembered by participants as thrilling, insight-generating experiences. We here at SAIS are truly honored to have the privilege of hosting today's program and others that are a virtual tribute to those vaunted seminars. Our current series takes its theme, the dilemmas and we've added and opportunities of the new global disorder from Dr. Brzezinski's prescient 2004 book, The Choice, a perfect frame for a moment in the world in which there are a dizzying number of international changes at play. I should note that today's seminar series is only one part of the Brzezinski Initiative at SAIS, which includes a unique set of new academic initiatives for the school, including fellowships. These distinctive pillars have already been set up through initial philanthropic gifts. And on behalf of the school, let me express great appreciation to our charter donors for their generous contributions. Also on behalf of the school, let me convey special thanks to the Brzezinski family, including Dr. Brzezinski's children, some of whom with their spouses are attending today's program. Mark, Mika, and Ian, we thank you for your support. And indeed, at the end of this seminar, we are so pleased that Mark, Ambassador Brzezinski, will say a few words and make a special announcement about the Brzezinski Initiative, as well as letting us know who the next Brzezinski Current Issues Seminar speaker will be. So audience, stay tuned. With that, I will briefly introduce our speakers today, and I hope you read the bios that accompany today's program announcement because I can't do justice uh, to either speaker in the time allowed, although in fact, really neither needs an introduction. Uh, the moderator of today's seminar, Dr. Elliot Cohen, was appointed the ninth Dean of Johns Hopkins SAIS in 2019. Dean Cohen has been an illustrious member of the school's faculty since he left Harvard for SAIS to become the Robert E. Osgood Professor of Strategic Studies in 1990 when he was not much older than most of his students. As a professor, Dean Cohen won prizes for his teaching and developed the renowned SAIS Strategic Studies curriculum. Prior to his appointment as Dean, Dr. Cohen founded and directed the Philip Merrill Center for Strategic Studies and served as Executive Vice Dean at SAIS. Dean Cohen previously served in the Army Reserve, was a director in the Defense, Department of Defense's policy planning staff, and has served as Counselor of the Department of State as Senior Advisor to Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice. For his leadership of the Gulf War Air Power Survey, he received the Air Force's Decoration for Exceptional Civilian Service. Dean Cohen is the author of many books, including The Big Stick, The Limits of Soft Power and the Necessity of Military Force, and Supreme Command, Soldiers, Statesmen, and Leadership in Wartime, and somehow also finds the time to be a contributing editor at The Atlantic. And of course, we are so very honored to have Ariana Huffington join us today for this timely conversation around the theme, The Dilemmas and Opportunities of New Global Disorder. As we all know, Ms. Huffington is the founder and CEO of Thrive Global, the founder of the Huffington Post, 
and the author of 15 books, including most recently, Thrive and The Sleep Revolution. It was in 2005 that she launched the Huffington Post, a news and blog site that quickly became one of the most widely read, linked to, and frequently cited media brands on the internet. In 2016, she launched Thrive Global, a leading behavior change tech company with the mission of changing the way we work and live by ending the collective delusion that burnout is the price we must pay for success. She's been named to Time Magazine's list of the world's 100 most influential people and the Forbes most powerful woman list. Originally from Greece, she moved to England when she was 16 and graduated from Cambridge University with a master's degree in economics. Ms. Huffington, it's exciting to have you with us here today. Welcome, and Dean Cohen, at long last, over to you. Great. Thank you, Carla, so much. Um, so the most important thing, may, may I call you Ariana? Oh, please. Uh, I will call you Dean Cohen, or can I call you Elliot? <laughs> uh, I think you have to. I think you have to. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for uh, being here. I want to uh, just very quickly add my thanks to, uh, to the Brzezinski family, uh, particularly to, to Mark. This is a great initiative and, you know, you're a great guest to have because you do embody um, many of Spig's qualities. I, used, I was actually able to get into the current issue seminar legitimately. I'm very proud of that. Um, and one of the things that was always so striking about Spig was just how wide ranging his intellect was. Uh, the range of different issues, including the issue of how we live, which is where I think I'd like to us to start. Um, just for those of you out there in the audience, uh, what we're going to do is until about 1.20, this will be a conversation. It'll be a genuine conversation going back and forth. I'll then open up the floor for questions. Uh, please use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And if you could identify yourself when you ask the, a question, I will, as uh, whenever possible, um, uh, privilege uh, students over uh, over everybody else um, in uh, in the posing of the questions. So let me. Um, uh, oh, I, and I should have added. I also want to thank the wonderful SICE team uh, for putting this all together. Let me uh, begin. I um, mean, you've done so many different things. You were politically active. You founded the Huffington Post. Uh, but I want to start with a great quote from you. Uh, which I think speaks to your current concerns. By any sane definition, if you find yourself lying in a pool of blood in your, on your office floor, you are not successful. So could you tell us how you came to uh, say that and where that led you? Um, I will, but first of all, let me say how delighted I am to be having this conversation with you. I, I love your writing. I spent the weekend reading a lot of what you've recently written and uh, absolutely loved it, uh, including your emphasis on poetry, which is one of my passions. And thank you so much, Carla, for your generous introduction and for all you do. So that actually is... Um, a, practically the opening line of my book, Thrive. And it describes my collapse um, in 2007, two years into building the Huffington Post. I was the divorced mother of two teenage daughters and I collapsed from exhaustion and burnout, broke my cheekbone um, on the way down. And that happened to be shortly after I had been um, uh, included in Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. So the contrast between the public image and the personal reality was particularly stark. And um, it really started me on this journey of um, recognizing that burnout is truly a global epidemic. Uh, I was not alone. Hundreds of millions of people around the world have been suffering from burnout and the casualties have been proliferating. The results have often been infinitely more dangerous and damaging than what happened to me. People having strokes, um, people having accidents, uh, falling asleep in the freeway, um, and um, also things that we are not as obvious, like leaders making bad decisions. You know, the connection between decision-making and uh, 
exhaustion is very clear, including uh, a piece that Admiral Stavridis uh, wrote on Thrive about sleep as a weapon of war, uh, tracing literally bad military decisions made by depleted um, leaders uh, running on empty. So as you alluded, in Cohen, that's kind of a passion of mine now, because again, um, to go back to a lot of the themes um, in, in, in the legacy of, of the institution here, um, it's about life. It's not just about foreign policy. It's not just about politics. If we don't get life right, we are going to continue making bad decisions. And I love what you wrote somewhere about the virus's impact on our character. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm, um, one thing that always struck me when I was in the government visiting uh, Iraq or Afghanistan is the best leaders were always ones who were extremely disciplined about things like sleep and even to the extent possible recreation, like, you know, reading science fiction for an hour or something like that. Could we, um, first, could you just tell us a little bit about Thrive Global? What, what is it? Uh, and, what does it do? So basically, after uh, my own collapse, I started uh, covering these issues pretty exhaustively at the Huffington Post. And um, by the time I left in 2016 to, to found Thrive Global, in fact, 50% of uh, our traffic was coming from people who cared more about life than about politics. Uh, the reason I decided to leave and create a new company was because I wanted to move from awareness to action. I wanted not just to help raise awareness about these topics, bring people the latest science, ancient wisdom, uh, storytelling, but also give them the tools uh, to help them make the changes in their lives. And that's why I launched Thrive, which is basically a behavior change company. We have launched a product um, which we offer to enterprises, to companies around the world. And um, that begins to give people the daily tools. We call them micro steps because the thing that makes me optimistic is that we can change behavior through daily, tiny, incremental steps. Yeah. And it's the combination of these micro steps together with inspiring content and new role models um, that help change the way we work and live. So, so um, I mean, it sounds as though you're optimistic that actually we're making progress uh, on this front. I remember reading a book a long time ago, The Relaxation Response, uh, I think it was by Harvey Benson, uh, which he was one who coined the term the fight or flight reflex. And part of his argument was that just being triggered all the time. He was, and he was writing about stress and so on. And he was pressing on uh, things like meditation and some of these older wellness practices. Um, but, you know, that was 50 years ago. And w why should we think that we're going to be able to um, get people to a better place given that we have so many gizmos that encourage people to uh, overwork and to stress out a lot more. Well, thank you so much for bringing up the relaxation response because it was a seminal book uh, because it brought science yeah. um, into this realm of what used to be spiritual wisdom. And, um, if we want to look at the whole world, I think one of the most important things that connect us globally is the fact that every spiritual tradition says the same thing at its heart. Whether we talk about the Tao, and I'd love to discuss that with Carla, who is such a Chinese expert, or um, Zen in Japan, or the Bhagavad Gita in India, or Stoic, or Stoic philosophers, they all say the same thing, which is at um, the center of each human being is this place of wisdom, peace, and strength. We all have access to it. 
it's as close to us as our next breath, but we need to intentionally tap into it. And um, we have a lot of uh, great role models throughout history. My favorite actually is Marcus Aurelius, who was emperor of Rome for 19 years, 14 of which he had to deal with a terrible plague. I hope ours isn't going to last that long. But he wrote this book called Meditations, which I actually think is a leadership manual. Yes. In which he described how he would really get into his inner citadel, is how he described it, and rule from that place. So I think that bringing all that wisdom back is absolutely essential as we are navigating these incredibly uncertain and anxious times. You know, I'm, uh, I'm so glad you mentioned the meditations. It's um, when I was running the strategic studies program, we would have a, an event for students at the end of the year. And, you know, they would say, what, what are the books that we should take away with us? That's the one. Oh, I love that. I've given it away more than any other book. So it's a, one, it's a wonderful, wonderful book. Um, could we talk, make, let's bring this closer to coronavirus, if we could. Um, and to working virtually, uh, you know, I've, I've been trying to uh, be Dean from my basement. Um, and I, I am concerned about uh, colleagues and uh, both faculty and staff, but also very much our students who find themselves kind of caught uh, sometimes in just constrained physical circumstances, but they're also operating all the time in the world that we're in right now, a Zoom world, where all you really have going seems to be your electronics. And I'm curious first, just um, empirically, do you think that this moment is going to cause people to be more uh, thoughtful and deliberate about getting that kind of balance in their lives? Or do you think it makes the problem worse? So I am very optimistic while being very clear about what a terrible time of trial this is. I'm in no way underestimating everything you mentioned, you know, the, the huge mental health problems we are dealing with that we have data about, you know, over 50% of people, according to the latest CDC survey, are suffering from anxiety, stress, people, more people are attempting suicide, including young people. So this is extremely serious. Not to mention all the financial losses, uh, loss of jobs, um, uncertainty about the future. But in the title of, of our session, you know, the dilemmas and opportunities of the new global disorder, I, I want to focus on the opportunities. And in order to focus on the opportunities, we need to remind ourselves that even before the pandemic, we were facing unprecedented and largely neglected disorders. And I don't think anyone should want to go back to where we were. And just to mention a few disorders, you know, the growing inequalities, mm -hmm. which are clearly destabilizing. And I don't know how many conferences Dean Coyne you went to, but I went to dozens of conferences about inclusive capitalism and the growing inequalities. There was a lot of talking and not enough action. And we are paying a price for that. We are paying a tremendous price because we are seeing that those who are now called essential workers, the grocery workers, the truck, the, those delivering our parcels on the trucks, um, um, on the factory floors, they're the ones most at risk at the moment, not just because they're more exposed to the virus, but because of multiple pre-existing conditions. And that's the other crisis that was with us pre-pandemic, the, the skyrocketing increase in chronic diseases like diabetes, like hypertension, which are behavior and lifestyle related. Um, seventy-five percent of them could be changed if we change the way we live and work, 
And that's why I'm so passionate about bringing these micro steps to people to help them. We are working with 2.2 million associates at Walmart, um, most of whom are working in the stores. And just by helping them practice these micro steps, inspiring them through stories of success among their peers, we have had amazing results, literally people losing 100 pounds, reversing diabetes. So we see here that we are never going to be able to solve these problems without changing behaviors. The mental health crisis pre-existed uh, before the pandemic. So there was like a perfect storm. And then the pandemic jumped on top of all this crisis. And now this is something that we can no longer avoid. You know, we really have to take steps. And unfortunately, as you know, Dean Cohen, because you're such a student of history, we, um, unfortunately, human beings don't make changes until they absolutely have to. Yeah. And so I'm very optimistic that this crucible we are in, and it is a crucible, will also be a catalyst for these fundamental changes that we needed even before the pandemic. You know, I, uh, I remember when the, early on I was speaking to one of, uh, one of my colleagues here, uh, Professor Ridd, and he turned to me and said, you know, this is going to be the biggest event in our lifetime, I bet. And I think he may be, I think he may be right. I'm, I'm going to follow up in just a moment, but I, I want to uh, remind everybody that if you have a question when we move to the Q&A, um, I would like you to, you, you can begin putting questions in there, uh, in there now. Um, so let me, let, let me continue on that theme for a bit. So, you know, you talked about changing lifestyle, which is often is about changing how we think about things, uh, and that which makes perfect sense to me. But what, what, one of the things I find interesting about this is you're talking about something that is not government driven, really. It is, uh, you know, uh, Thrive Global is a, uh, is a company, but there are also room for nonprofits and so on. And do you see us moving to a different, um, a somewhat different kind of model in which the role of government in promoting um, what is essentially public health shifts in some fundamental way, or do you view this as essentially, I don't know, kind of additive to where we were? I think it's imperative um, that everyone is engaged in this huge undertaking. Business at the moment has become the biggest platform for change. And actually, in, um, in a lot of the surveys, people trust their business leaders, their employer, more than they trust government or the media. What, so, why do you think that's the case? Well, partly because we have a, a rather untrustworthy <laughs> um, um, leader in the White House, and, and thank you for your leadership in uh, pointing out uh, um, the fact that uh, whether you're a Republican or a Democrat, we are talking about facts and science. And in the middle of a public health crisis, the information disseminated to the public is extremely important. Um, people are very susceptible. And so we're seeing the dangers of that. So we cannot in any way underestimate that. At the same time, public health is a community undertaking. And it starts with each individual. And uh, we are working, for example, with the Harvard School of Public Health and Thrive and uh, CAA have launched an initiative that's a, through our foundation called First Responders First. How to help the frontline healthcare workers who are um, literally in the front lines of this crisis and how to help them, not just with protective equipment, which a lot of others are doing, but with needs, um, mental health needs, childcare needs, accommodation needs, to approach the whole human. And I feel that's really one of the changes in how we look at health, to look at our whole humanity. Um, in our uh, Thrive product, for example, Dean Cohen, we have four journeys. 
recharge, which is about sleep, which as you know, is foundational. I'm happy to put the PDF of my sleep book um, in your resources for everybody attending because the science is unequivocal. Um, unless you have a genetic mutation and one to one and a half the percent of the population does and don't need a lot of sleep. The rest of us need seven to nine hours, not just for our physical health, but for our brain to detox. Um, so that's the recharge journey, including 60 second recharging breaks during the day to prevent uh, stress from becoming cumulative. The second is fuel. What do we eat? How much do we move? The third is focus. You alluded to that. You know, our growing addiction to our phones and, and um, social media is definitely interfering with our focus and our productivity. And the final one, the fourth one is connect, which starts with a connection with ourselves. What Archimedes said, give me a place to stand and I will move the world where if we are disconnected from that place, we are much more vulnerable and much more fragile, uh, which is a terrible place to be in during um, a time of crisis like this. And from that place of connection with ourselves, we are more empathetic and find it easier to connect with others. So, you know, one, one of the things that, uh, that I saw that I was glad to see you say is that you're, as far as I can tell, your own favor of naps which I have, I have long been in favor of. Uh, Amazing. Well, you and Winston Churchill, who, who, who I, named I hear, power naps. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, the other thing actually that's interesting about Churchill is he would not let people disturb his sleep. You know, I, one of the things that's always struck me as absurd about the modern presidency, uh, doesn't make a difference who's in, is that everybody thinks you're supposed to wake up the president to tell him things that he can't do anything about. <laughs> just, just so he can get anxious. Like and Churchill basically, I think, I'm not sure that they ever woke him up during the war. He said, don't wake me up. This is so important, unless there is something I can do. And you know, this is interesting. We are working at Thrive with a lot of um, executives and um, in different companies. And for I was speaking with the executive leadership team running Accenture. They have 500,000 employees in multiple countries, multiple time zones, and they were all exhausted. So we basically had to create a mindset shift that is not self-indulgent to take care of yourself when you're a leader. It's actually essential in order to be a good leader. And there's, there's so much we can do, uh, starting with delegating and um, I'm a big believer, if you're a leader who may have to be woken up at some point, get a, um, remember the old fashioned flip phones that don't have any data on them? <laughs> and I can't go that far. Whoever needs to wake you up, wakes you up, but this thing should not be sleeping with you. <laughs> you have hundreds of micro steps, but let me leave you with my favorite one which is, this is not a phone. This is a nuclear weapon. It contains every project, every worry, every problem in your life, and all the science and all the ancient wisdom tells us we need to separate ourselves from that in order to restore and renew ourselves through sleep. So, you, you know, you're a great uh, world traveler. Um... I, I wonder, is it your view that this is a, a problem that's particularly acute in the United States? I mean, Americans have had a, uh, a long history of being reputed to work too much. I mean, that you can find, there's an essay by William James about this, uh, going back to the end of the 19th century. Um, is that your view, or do you think that this is basically something that's now essentially a global phenomenon and it just the United States, you have a particular manifestation of it. It is a global phenomenon. And um, what is fascinating is that in the different cultures we go to, the different countries, we try and bring in their own wisdom from the past. Mm -hmm. And 
and people are so disconnected from it. But when we, we created, for example, a video series on Chinese wisdom, I have to send it to Carla. Um, when people are exposed to it, they, it really resonates. It's kind of in their DNA and it makes it easier to adopt these new practices. But otherwise, I mean, look at China, you know, look at the, the way they work. It's like everything is as, um, at the service of their job. And the connection they fail to see is that their job suffers. Yeah. I, I love to look at athletes as a role model because athletes know that recovery is part of training you're not going to uh, get ready for um, game day or game night uh, by staying up all night or eating junk. They know that, they have the data to prove it, and we all need to learn from that. Yeah. It's, uh, I mean, that, that in a way goes back to uh, our favorite author, uh, Marcus Aurelius, who does, I think, he views yourself as being in training. Um, a, a kind of a constant training uh, to be able to adapt to all circumstances. And I think that is a, a large uh, part of it. Um, let me, uh, we're, we're coming up with the uh, Q&A and we got a lot of people who have questions. Uh, I do want to, I do want to go to politics, if I might, for just a moment. Yes. Um, so you uh, exited the Republican Party before some of the rest of us did. Um, <laughs> You had been, you know, I think it's fair to say, pretty staunch uh, um, conservative slash member of the Republican Party. Um, you know, I was struck last night. Uh, there's a whole string of Republicans there uh, saying they're going to vote for Joe Biden, not just with clean consciences, but with enthusiasm. Uh, so given that you've had that experience in your life, uh, given that you've been a, an acute observer of things social and political, could you talk to us just a little bit about that? Yes, so my own transition in the 90s um, had the, to do with my understanding of the role of government. I was always passionate about the importance of community, mm -hmm. the importance of everybody being involved in service. Um, I, I was one of the first board members of the Points of Light Foundation that, for example, that President Bush instituted, because I really believe in that concept that life has also to be about service. And so I was concerned about delegating all that to the government. But I also realized that he, some of the problems are so intractable that you also do need the raw power of government appropriations to solve them. So that was my own transition. Right now, um, what we're seeing and why we're seeing um, thoughtful Republicans like you and like John Kasich last night um, um, wanting a change in, a, in, um, in the administration is because of, I think, the reverence for facts, for science, and um, for bringing the nation together. I think these are the most essential elements right now. We cannot keep tearing each other apart. Mm. I mean, as of course that great president told us, you know, a house divided cannot stand and we are so divided right now. And also we are willing to believe the worst of the other side and, and everybody is at fault of that. And that has to change as well. And Part of what you said earlier is for me the key. We need to recognize that everybody can change. Redemption is at the heart of social progress. Whether we're talking about Black Lives Matter or many aggressions in the workplace, we need to give people the opportunity to change, to learn, to redeem themselves. And, um, and that applies across the spectrum, whether you are in prison and we believe that you can be reformed, whether you made a mistake in the workplace, in the language you used or in what you did, and you should not be canceled for life, but you should be given an opportunity uh, to learn and improve. 
that is a, this is really at the heart of what we need to come together about right now, because otherwise we will keep tearing each other apart. So let me ask just two last questions. The first is, um, your optimism is moving. Um, it's also, if I may say so, extremely American. And Greek. And Greek? Okay. I'll take <laughs> that. But where does it come from? I mean, you're, you know, given the magnitude of the, the challenges and problems that you describe, there's just a glow of optimism there. So tell me where that comes from. Well, it comes from two things. It comes from my profound belief that by virtue of our birthright, we have that place of wisdom, compassion, and indeed love inside us. We just need to tap into it. We just need to get rid of all the stuff that gets in the way. And also, it comes from what you described in one of your articles, um, in my belief in the decency and fortitude of average citizens, which we see every day. You know, our media, unfortunately, tends to focus on all the disorders, on all the things that are dysfunctional. And it's much harder to find the extraordinary daily acts of courage and compassion um, that are happening everywhere. And I, I, when I was at the Huffington Post, I, I tried to emphasize those in our coverage. And now at Thrive, we have thousands of people writing about these stories because that's how we can inspire each other and tap into that optimism. Yeah. I think that's a very important role of, um, of, of leaders, too, not to let people wallow in negativity. I mean, not to be unrealistic about uh, the problems that there are, but, but not to wallow in it um, and to think positively and optimistically. Okay, so one last question. I'm, I've run a little bit over. I apologize. Um, you said you love poetry. Who's your favorite poet? Oh, well, you know, my favorite poet is Rumi. Ah, okay. And uh, at my favorite Rumi line is, live life as though everything is rigged in your favor. Mm -hmm. How about that for optimism, Dean Cohen? That's, uh, that's really good. I, I was thinking you might say Kabafi, but... Oh, I'll... I like Kabafi too. Um, but Rumi is, is my favorite optimistic <laughs> yeah. uh, poet. He's a, a beautiful poet. Okay, I'm, uh, I'm being irresponsible here. Um, what does Ms. Huffington think about the recent arrest of Li Ying, Jimmy Lai, owner of Apple Daily in Hong Kong? Well, obviously, um, what is happening in Hong Kong is... Um, incredibly painful and, and troubling. And, and it seems that China has decided um, to use every measure at its disposal, and it has every measure at its disposal, um, to put an end to any um, glimmer of hope uh, of, um, of a truly democratic Hong Kong. Say more about what that means for U.S.-China relations, could you? Well, this is only one of the many problems um, in China relations. And I feel we should go to Carla to give us a fuller explanation. But I mean, with the position taken by the administration at the moment, um, not just in terms of politics and trade, but in terms of whether an American company like Microsoft can buy TikTok. Um, I mean, we are in uncharted waters. And uh, what is unfortunate is that this has always been a relationship that, that required um, incredible diplomacy and uh, it wasn't an easy relationship ever to navigate uh, going back to the Nixon going to China. Uh, right now all that has been thrown aside and we'll have to wait and see what happens if there is a new administration next January.
Yeah, it sounds like that one is challenging even your optimism a bit. <laughs> uh, Katie Fung, a uh, second year MA student at SAIS. How can we expect people to change behavior to adopt restful lifestyles when the minimum wage in Florida is less than 850, a significant population lacks health insurance and people lack housing security? Individuals are not enabled to adopt healthier choices because of very serious opportunity costs. So now what? So let me just explain, thank you so much for this question, that I'm not looking for a restful lifestyle. Uh, I'm more engaged than ever. Uh, I'm not against hard work. I love hard work. I'm against diminishing returns of uh, working beyond the point of being our best. And absolutely, uh, everything we're saying here does not in any way minimize uh, what we also discussed, which is the plight of millions of people without jobs, without health insurance. But you know, Viktor Frankl, in the middle of concentration camp, wrote about the fact that really, the more adverse the circumstances, the more we need to tap into our own resilience to deal with them and survive. So this is not in any way to minimize what we need to do uh, in terms of public policy. We are not saying, you know, hey, take care of yourself, recharge, um, make better choices, and we don't need to do anything in Washington or on in state government. Absolutely not. As um, Van Jones wrote on Thrive, he said, I'm going to make better choices for my health, not instead of fighting for social justice, but in order to fight for social justice more vigorously and live longer to fight for social justice. So listen, truth is paradoxical. Truth is not either or. So we need to be able to hold both these thoughts in our heads because unfortunately, a lot of social activists think that somehow we cannot talk about the choices we are making as individuals because that somehow they think minimizes the obligations of government and of business leaders. It does not. Yeah. You, you mentioned uh, Viktor Frankl, uh, Man's Search for Meaning. It's another book for, for the time. And I believe he was in Auschwitz. Yes. And it, and and it's, he lost his pregnant mother, his, his pregnant wife, his family in the camps. And yet he was able to really give us a, a roadmap for yeah. dealing with a, even like um, unprecedented adversity. Uh, from Xiaoyan Fang, um, as a woman and an immigrant, what advice would you give to a young woman, originally, to young women rather, originally from outside of the United States or who are pursuing a media, media career here? Well, first of all, um, I'm delighted that you are pursuing a media career here. We need multiple perspectives. And, um, and what is great about pursuing a media career now is that while you are um, looking for where you want to work, you can also start writing, uh, creating videos. You know, media has been democratized. Um, so even if you can't write for the Atlantic, like Dean Cohen, um, you can write on your own blog, you can put it on Facebook, you can put it on Medium. We have tens of thousands of people contributing on Thrive. Get in touch with me, we'd love you to post it on Thrive. So this is something that is new. So you can create your own body of work and use social media to amplify your message while at the same time pursuing whatever career you want in mainstream media. Could, could, could I just ask a follow-up to that? Um, because, you know, you, you made the Huffington Post this extraordinarily successful platform. Um, and I think at, at very optimistic time for social media, and of course, now we've, we're coming through a phase where some of the big platforms like Facebook and Twitter and YouTube uh, are getting a lot of criticism. Uh, and where some people would argue 
that one of the great dangers that we face is, you know, we're going to dissolve into a kind of a very um, constrained set of bubbles where one group of people are only going to get their uh, news from Fox. Another group, meaning no offense, Mika and Joe, will only get it from MSNBC. Um, uh, and others, you know, from God knows what, uh, Breitbart or uh, OAN. And so how, how do you view uh, social media now? I mean, is, is, do we have a, a different, somewhat darker view, or is that misplaced? Well, first of all, I really want to make a distinction, not just because I love Mika, although I do love Mika, uh, between Fox and MSNBC. I'll take that. Uh, only because, you see, I think for me, what distinguishes um, media is reverence for facts. It's like, yes, everybody has a right to their own opinion, not to their own set of facts. And that's really the distinction here. And what's happening with social media is because of confirmation bias, um, there is a tendency to amplify whatever is going to reinforce our existing positions. And that applies to liberals too. It's like people are willing to believe anything they hear <laughs> about Trump or anyone on the other side they disagree with. Um, I think you wrote in one of your pieces, Dean Cohen, that um, it comes under the category of too good to check. Yeah. But this is not a new problem. I mean, I remember writing endlessly about Judy Miller and the New York Times. Yeah. The New York Times thought that all these um, um, stories about um, Saddam Hussein having... Um, all these weapons he didn't end up having uh, were too good to check. Yeah. But, but do you think that we'll, well, or let me ask, uh, again, this is really a follow-up. Again, I'm, I'm actually tapping some of the questions that are here. Um, you know, when uh, we were both younger, you know, you had Walter Cronkite uh, and people like that, and new, news was conveyed in that, much more, I think, in that way. And, you know, he was at least seen as a fairly neutral kind of figure. Will we ever go back to anything remotely like that? Or should we just forget about it? I don't think we're going to go back to anything. <laughs> okay. Uh, which is good and bad. But I think let's focus on what's good about it. Because there's so much I'd like to leave behind and jettison as we are going through this pandemic portal. Um, let me ask a question from Omar Garcia Bolivar. What is Thrive Global uh, doing in the developing world? So we actually have opened up, um, an office in Mumbai and we're doing a lot in India. In fact, I have a big webinar tonight um, with SNP that has 9,000 employees in, in India. And, um, and we are finding right now that the mental health crisis that was already um, very serious pre-pandemic has uh, dramatically um, exa been exacerbated because of the pandemic. So everything that um, we are doing here, um, we are also uh, doing in the developing world. A lot of the companies we're working with have offices and employees all around the world. Uh, we are also in uh, Greece and Romania. And uh, it's just great to see how universal uh, the problems and the needs as well as the solutions are. They have to be customized. Uh, but they are pretty universal. We've offered, for example, our mental health um, uh, workshop, which we developed in partnership with Stanford based on the latest uh, brain science, so that we can also prevent depression and anxiety. As you can see, I'm, I'm a passionate believer in prevention, uh, not just uh, um, dealing with problems once they emerge. And all over, and the world, by helping people identify their own stress responses, 
we can help them prevent stress from becoming depression and anxiety. And that applies to every country around the world and to every demographic, whether you are now working from home or working in a store, which is also another cause for optimism, Dean Cohen, because we see how interconnected we are. I thought you were going to call me Elliot. And I decided somehow that I was going to call you Dean Cohen. <laughs> Um, uh, Ayaboni uh, Akindoli, who is a SAIS alum, MA-19, uh, uh, um, asked a question which ties into the earlier conversation. Could you please share your thoughts on the use of social media for fake news for political campaigns and any thoughts on what potential measures Facebook, for instance, could use to avoid this? And speaking of journalism, uh, um, Ayaboni says that I intend to write about this insightful session and send the article to a Nigerian newspaper. Fantastic. Also send it to Thrive. I'll give you my email address, everyone. ah at thriveglobal.com. Anything you write, not just about this, but about anything uh, that has to do with how we live our lives. And um, we would love to publish and social. We have about 36 million users across all our platforms. And I love a conversation especially among, um, among such smart and uh, multicultural um, uh, audiences as the one we have here. So I, I'm a big believer in the fact that um, Twitter and Facebook and everyone in social media needs to take a strong, clear line on, um, on falsehoods. Um, that's, I've been passionate about that forever. Um, I think the problem started even before social media. Climate change um, led to a lot of this um, um, view from nowhere, meaning, you know, you had the supposedly objective moderators having a discussion between a scientist talking about the dangers of climate change and someone talking about how climate change did not exist. And these were supposed to be given equal weight. So that, as I said, was supposed to be good neutral reporting. It's not. And it's lousy practice among social media companies to allow uh, falsehoods and conspiracy theories uh, to be perpetuated. What about just as a quick follow up on that, the, um, you know, one thing that strikes me on digital platforms, say, if you look at the digital version of the Washington Post, if you look at the print version, reporting and opinion are really put in separate places. Uh, and so you know which one you're getting. On the digital version, for completely understandable reasons, they're much more interpenetrated. Um, is that a problem, do you think? Is that something that so-called mainstream journalists need to think about and outlets like the Post or the Times or you know, whatever you please? You know, I think even uh, in the digital versions of the Post or the Times, I think you can see uh, what are the reported pieces and what are opinion pieces uh, either by their own reporters or by outside contributors. Um, I think, again, the most important thing is to, uh, to be clear that truth exists, uh, that facts exist, and, uh, and to have a certain kind of reverence for that. Uh, that that's, a f I, I feel, the most important thing we need. And I'm going to start calling you Elliot as we're coming to the end. I think I'm getting used to it now. <laughs> Well, uh, unfortunately, we are coming to the end of this. I, I do want you to know that I've already have at least one student here who has said, what's the best or most appropriate way to reach you in order to participate, collaborate, and thrive? You've I given, love that. I, I just gave you my email address. Okay. I'll repeat it. It's ah at thriveglobal.com. I'm also happy to work with uh, your team at the school to put up any additional resources. And um, if you want to subscribe to my newsletter, it's Ariana, it's thriveglobal.com slash Ariana. So I would love to stay in touch. This is such a fascinating conversation and uh, I've loved all the questions. Well, I, I will vouch for uh, all the size students who will be coming your way. They're, 
They're just the group of people you want to uh, be interacting with. Um, unfortunately, we've hit 140, so I'm just going to conclude with two requests. First, you keep on calling me Elliot, and secondly, <laughs> that uh, you promise to come back because we, we really would love to have you here again, uh, perhaps in person, but if, if not, then uh, uh, virtually this way. Thank you so much. It's been a wonderful. Thank you so much. I, I've really loved it, and, and, and thank you, Mark, for bringing us together. Carla, I think we uh, turn it over to you. Or to Mark, I guess to Mark. I'm, I'm actually here, I'm having um, dealing with my video. Here we go. Uh, I, I know I speak for the audience in telling you both that to, today's program was riveting, not, not just provocative, but uh, also uh, perhaps unexpectedly so positive and really inspiring. Of course, the inspiring part is not surprising of our guest who's demonstrated throughout her career a capacity for visionary thinking. Um, I personally found the discussion uh, linking the human behaviors, the personal, even the, the basic human need of sleep, which I never get enough of, to everything from the social challenges that we face in our society, like chronic health issues, to what might even be brittle, unimaginative dis decisions made by depleted leaders, as, as Ariana Huffington put it, so, so important. But also there's that idea that there's the human capacity for both change and for decency. That was so critical. So the conversation at least reminded me that there's truth in, uh, was it Romer's observation that a crisis is a terrible thing to waste? <laughs> we have a chance to actually shift the paradigm rather than having the current crisis or crises do that for us. And of course, it would be nice if we could do this with support from our political leadership. Uh, thank you so much, Dean Cohen, and thank you so much, Ariana Huffington, for this intellectually stirring and meaningful hour. And let me also thank the audience for your part in the discussion. You brought such excellent questions. Uh, before we go, though, I want to thank the Brzezinski family again for their support. And as mentioned, when we began today's program, and as Dean Cohen reminded us, we want to give one of, uh, one of the members of the family, uh, Mark Ambassador Brzezinski, a few minutes now uh, before we close to make a very special announcement. Uh, Ambassador Brzezinski, Mark. Thank you, Carla, and thank you, Dean Cohen, and a very, very big thanks to our friend Ariana for participating in today's virtual program. All the Brzezinskis are grateful, and I have to say, that was just terrific. My late father was a big proponent in balance in life as a way to have a good life and as a way to be effective. And I have to share with you that as national security advisor at the height of the Cold War, he would come home almost every night and have dinner with his family. Of course, he would work after dinner, but he would take long walks with us. And as I got older, I told him how much I appreciated that he did that because Mika, Ian, and I weren't the easiest of kids. I don't think it was rest. That's what he was getting when he would come back to us. And he said that he did it for himself, that he needed to recharge and that he wanted to have a multi-dimensional life. And I think he would have loved what you said today and thought your comments were totally poignant for the challenges of our time. So I wish he had heard you today. Uh, and I think in spirit, he was probably listening. So I have two timely announcements. First, I am thrilled to announce our speaker for September, someone who couldn't be better positioned to offer perspectives at this moment. Vas Narasinham, CEO of Novartis, is one of the youngest Fortune 100 CEOs and a child of immigrants from India to the US. He's a medical doctor who specializes in vaccine development and especially on the intersection of immunology and public policy. Voss is perfectly poised to bridge medical innovation with the systems needed to deploy it and the broader socio-political context. And I'm very much looking forward to this important and relevant dialogue in September. And second, I am thrilled to announce some huge news on behalf of the Brzezinski Initiative and my family an exclusive, sweeping, and expansive biography of my late father's life and legacy will be written by one of the most well-renowned journalistic luminaries and public thought leaders of our time, 
Edward Luce, the U.S. national editor of the Financial Times. Ed will be using as resources my father's private personal writings, letters, intimate family and high-profile interviews, documents from the Zbigniew Brzezinski holding at the Library of Congress, among other resources. As you've seen from earlier this month with the passing of the inestimable Brent Scowcroft, there is a thirst in the general public for the vision and compass and narrative associated with the great people who led American policy in the last century and into this century. And this book, I think, will go far in feeding this appetite. And I'm so pleased that the Johns Hopkins University SICE Zbigniew Brzezinski program will be providing a research assistant for this undertaking. This research assistant will be funded by a SICE alumnus whose life was very much guided by my father's worldview and who has committed to support this initiative. We're so thrilled and honored by this. And so again, in closing, on behalf of the Brzezinski family, thank you to Dean Cohen, to Ariana for this pivotal dialogue, to Dr. Freeman for the FPI's commitment and support of the Brzezinski Initiative, and to the charter donors of this initiative. We look forward to seeing all of you in September for the next Brzezinski Current Issues Seminar. Thank you. <laughs>